Tracy. And I'm Sharon. And we are Feet of Clay. Confessions of the Cult Sisters. A few weeks ago, we spent an entire afternoon talking with someone who was very special to us all the way back in the 1970s and 80s, and it was so wonderful to reconnect with her. Mm -hmm. That person was none other than Keith Green's foster daughter. The Christian world knew her then as Dawn Green. And in fact, she is the only living person who actually knew and experienced Keith Green as a father. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's something to think about, huh? (laughs) That is, definitely. Don, of course, started living with Keith and Melody at age 10, beginning in California, and then moving with you all when you guys all went to Mm -hmm. Texas. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, you know, Sharon, I really had to take some time after our conversation with her to absorb and process all the things we learned in our conversation with Don before we could post and share it all out here on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Me me too. I, w- I was surprised. It was a pretty emotional experience for me. A couple things really stood out. Number one, Dawn's amazing awareness and resiliency, like at every stage of her life, mm-hmm. you know, young child, teenager, young adult, and, and all the way through to today. And then number two, my God, I mean, just how very sad I felt realizing that the things that I had kind of suspected about her emotional isolation and neglect, that those things, they were actually even more real and, and more profound for her than I had thought. Mm-hmm. You know, Sharon, in hearing her story, I was able to look back at everything that you and I experienced through an entirely new lens. Hmm. We, you and I, granted, we were young when we chose to go to Last Days Ministries, but we did just that. We chose to go. Right, and, right. Uh, and even the fact, you know, we both had graduated. We were young, but we did have a life outside of Last Days Ministries. Mm-hmm. We did have a life outside of that communal system of high control. And I guess as she was sharing, it just struck me afresh that's all she knew since she was 10 years old. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. And, you know, I think her perspective and experience, it's really important for people to hear this. And I know the interview is going to be very, very interesting to many people. There's going to be those who personally knew Dawn back at Last Days Ministries, and I think they're really going to want to hear how she is. Mm-hmm. And then also, the many tens, if not hundreds of thousands of Keith Green, let's call them groupies, you know, (laughs) they may still be current fans, or they may Mm -hmm. be former followers, or they may be like us kind of fully recovered and and out of it all. Yeah. And, you know, I wanted a chance for us to at least touch base about this, because I, I struggled with some fresh anger after doing that, or actually during the interview. Mm -hmm. And most of the people, if you know, you only are familiar with Don's story through the book, No Compromise, the story of Keith Green by Melody Green. We often put that in our show notes because that has a lot of touch points in it that is the record to the world of that story. Mm -hmm. And you can hear me in some of the interview questions. I'm wrestling with some of these emotions. And I I think one of them, I end up asking a question that's completely a word salad because I'm trying (laughs) to corral these rising emotions enough so that I can get out of the way and let her tell her story. I know. I know. I could tell Tracy because I know (laughs) you so well. I could, I could hear it in your voice. And I also thought, my gosh, I feel like, man, maybe I'm just too low energy too, because this is emotionally impacting me. Yeah. And I can hear some of my (gasps) like gasps that I'm trying (laughs) to, you know, tamp myself down because the harm to Dawn, uh, and I think it's definitely understated in several places, is so real and so deep. Yeah, let me and just let me just let me just underscore that. It's really understated in places. Like she'll just be saying something and then just mm-hmm. casually say, Oh, yeah, and that's what happened. And I'm thinking to myself, holy shit, that's huge. 
It's so huge. And I think because we say at the beginning, this is our first time interviewing and really trying to step out of the story enough so that it doesn't become, oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) And so that's why I'm really grateful that we can have this opportunity just to to kind of reflect before we we share the story with the world. Mm -hmm. You know, she was a completely vulnerable and totally dependent young girl. And as she tells her story, it really sheds light in a different way of what it is like to grow up under that no compromise mentality and how it played out in real life. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh it was definitely it was definitely some heavy stuff for for me to hear and to to think back through. Yes. Yeah. And folks, as you listen, you're going to notice there are several times when Dawn talks about how Keith was confronting and punishing her for having, quote, a bad attitude, end quote. And in reality, what she was experiencing was extreme loneliness and depression. And sadly, you know, there, there's just no room in that last day's belief system for anything about mental health, or no one would ever think of contacting a qualified professional, uh, you know, anything secular, that's, mm-hmm. that's not going to fly. And for us, like all the answers were with God and the Bible. That was it. Those, that's every answer you need. Now, yeah. and, and to be fair, society back then wasn't all that aware about mental health issues either, but also realized that the core problem that inflicted so much damage was this black and white view of quote, sin, and quote, holiness, which was compounded with all this immature, arrogant belief that all of us had back then. Yeah, it was definitely in all of us back then. It's this arrogant belief that we could somehow, quote, hear from God about another person or even for another person. You'll hear that Don had some significant struggles, but it's not all gloom and doom. Nope, nope. The beautiful thing is that in the end, freedom and peace and love have dawned brightly in her soul, haven't they? Yes, yes, they have. Did you notice what I did there with her name? Dawned, (laughs) dawned brightly. (laughs) I did notice that. And I think I was so grateful that at least that sentence had other words that didn't all start with a D. So I was like, I'm going to give that one to her. (laughs) Thank you. We are really glad to be able to share with you the story of how Dawn finally found her true self. Here comes part one of our conversation with foster daughter of Keith and Melody Green. Tracy, I am so excited because we have actually our first guest. Yes, yes. So we get to be the interviewers. Yes. Yeah. This is going to be my first time doing it. So hopefully I don't totally suck, but you may have to be the one to uh, pitch in and (laughs) save the day. (laughs) Or we will have to enhance our editing skills and fix it on the back end. (laughs) Maybe so. Maybe so. All right, folks. Well, we are really excited today to introduce someone to you. I actually first met her in 1979. I was 17 years old. She was 14 years old at the time. And I first met her as Dawn Green, the foster daughter of Keith and Melody Green. So Dawn, welcome to our crazy little adventure here. (laughs) Thanks for having me. We are just really, really excited to talk with you. And you are living kind of uh, in the middle of the country now, out in the Midwest, right? Yes. Yes, in Iowa. Very good. And I'm down in Florida right now. And Tracy, you are where? I am in Knoxville, Tennessee. So we have the miracle of technology, which hopefully our blend from these three locations, the sound file will still be okay. So (laughs) yes. So Dawn, when you and I first met, it's so funny, I'm going to tell you, this is this is what's a little silly to me as I think about it, is I was only 17, you were 14, we're only a few years apart, and yet I kind of looked at you as this little girl, but you were really coming of age. When I read the book, No Compromise, The Life Story of Keith Green, written by Melody Green, and I only read it for the first time a couple months ago. It was really interesting to me to 
kind of put myself back in that situation, those suburbs of Woodland Hills, California, and to remember this sweet, beautiful, smart young lady that you were. And we are so interested to hear your take on all of that stuff. So where would you like to start, Dawn? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should start at the beginning. Um, Let's do start, that. Just to give everybody a background. So my birth name, as I'm sure most people are, are curious, I was born Dawn Michelle Hutchison. I was born in Texas, believe it or not. Oh, and really? What, part, yeah. what What town? What town of Texas? Uh, um, Fort Sam, Houston, San Antonio. Oh, okay. wow. A Texan. So, yeah. Yeah. Army Hospital. So it doesn't really count, right? <laughs> 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 um, my parents divorced when I was two. And my mom, my aunt, my mother's sister, and I moved to L.A. Then when I was six... My mom and I started going to these ashrams. The first one we went to was, was a Krishna temple. Krishna, um, K R I S H. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Krishna, like Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. And that was in you know? LA? Yes. And so here I am, <clears throat> excuse me, six years old and watching all these people jumping up and down and <laughs> playing instruments and chanting yeah. Hare Krishna. This was crazy. And uh, it was a big note. <laughs> we didn't go back. So yeah. was that the actual Hare Krishna? Because I know Krishna in Hinduism, you know, there are different uh, sects that, mm -hmm. you know, follow Krishna. Was that the official Hare Krishna during that time? Do you know? Yes, it was the official Hare Krishna, not Hinduism that includes Krishna. This is Hare Krishna. Do you know mm -hmm. the guys you saw at the at the airport? Right, yes. in the orange, yes. in the orange yes. clothes. The orange yes. outfits. Yes. Def definitely orange and yellow. puts us in that think, time period, yeah. I think orange was like you're married and yellow, you're single or something like that. I can't remember. Yeah, it was it was weird. It was very weird. So we did not go back. But we did go to Paramahansa Yogananda's Self-Realization Fellowship Temple. And okay. um, yeah, it was very, very cool. Learned a lot about uh, the different masters. Jesus was there, was part of their teachings. They um, included many different masters. This was not just exclusively Paramahansa Yogananda. And also at the same time, I was in a private school. And what was very cool about the school was that morning recess was we practiced yoga and meditation. My mom decided she was going to be a vegetarian. And this is how cool my mom is, you guys. She is amazing. So she came to me and said, you know, I'm going to be a vegetarian from now on. I am not going to cook meat. I am not going to buy meat. But if you want to continue eating meat, that's okay. So she left it up to me. Is that like awesome or what? That's, that's amazing. And that's, that's how she was with me. And what so age just, was this again, Dawn? How, how old six. were you? I was six okay. years old. So you were still six. And um, do you remember about how old your mom would be during this time? Um, she had me when she was 19. Okay. So what would that be? 25, -ish. 25 mid 20s. Uh, yeah. We're, yeah. We're doing math really fast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's the way she was. So, uh, and at the beginning, I didn't understand being a vegetarian and I did not want to give up McDonald's hamburgers. Just didn't want to do that. But it was because I didn't understand why are we becoming vegetarians. But the more we went to the ashram and um, we went to Paramahansa Yogananda's ashram and we also went to Sri Swami Satchidananda's ashram. And so getting into it, I really started understanding the reason behind it. And after I grasped that, you could not pay me to eat meat. It was just really? became a part of my understanding. This is about taking care of my temple, my body, my mind, and, and all of that. So, you know, seven, eight years old, I understood this. And, and the school you were going to was a private school, but it was not religiously affiliated, obviously. This is uh, correct. allowing, was it like a Montessori school that would allow mm. everyone to have a similar understanding? I'm not really sure. Because they, they didn't really teach yoga as far as the philosophy 
um, we just practice yoga at, at morning recess. And then at the end, we did a meditation. Wow. Um, okay. So and at the ashram, we would do meditations, different types of meditations and breathing and and stuff like that. So, I mean, it would, the school was just a regular school. I mean, it, it was a one classroom. So we, I had other students that were in there with that, uh, were learning other things that were more advanced than me because they were older than I was. Like somebody was learning Latin. I think he was like 13 or something. And then they had younger kids like me who were learning how to write, you know? So it's a, it was a room full of, um, a lot of different people. And I felt like this was a way for me to really understand other people and learn to be more accepting and respectful because I understood older kids in this classroom with me. I don't know how to, cool. how to explain it any better yeah. than that. But, no, that's, um, that's very yeah. well explained. And that's a great foundational experience at a very young age. Mm -hmm. I, I ask about Montessori school because uh, one of my sons went to Montessori for a time. And I think in all of our educational experiences, that's one of my favorite uh, methodologies for that very reason. You're in with older kids, you're learning at different paces. So mm -hmm. a little bit of background on there. That's very good. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and Dawn, you were at that school through what age or grade? Two years. So first okay. and second grade. And that yeah. was in Southern California. Then, yes, in LA. Yep. Okay, so let's uh, fast forward. I was nine years old. My mother, this is about the time when I met Keith and Melody. We went to the Blah Blah Cafe. Um, it's mentioned in the book. And my mom met uh, a guy and she was very careful that she and I moved in with. She really liked this guy. And uh, he wanted to move to Colorado. So we packed up and, and moved. My grandparents lived there. And um, later, my, my mom and this guy broke up. And she was um, wanting to go back to LA. And I asked if I could stay with my grandparents, because I had been going over there and every once in a while and visiting. This is my dad's parents. This is not okay. my mom's parents. Okay. Dawn, had you been in touch with your father at all? Um, I've written, I had written a few letters to him, kept in touch a little bit, not uh, real tight. When you were with your grandparents, his, mm -hmm. his parents, was he in the picture at all at that point or just your grandparents? He was living in Florida and had been remarried and had two children with uh, his new wife. And I was, when I moved in with grandma and grandpa, their youngest son was still living at home. He was 17. He was in his last year of high school. And um, during the summer, my grandparents flew me down to Florida to visit my dad and okay. meet my half sister and half brother. So that was kind of neat. That was neat. Yeah. Yeah. So then um, I was staying with grandma and grandpa and things were going well. And I was going to church and um, my grandmother played the piano and organ at church. So we were there every time there was church service. I got to really see what church and Christianity was all about. I did, had not been exposed to it. So I didn't know, I didn't know anything. So here I am nine, nine years old. And I decided I asked to ask my grandmother, well, how do you become a Christian? Because I was very curious. So she called up the pastor and the pastor came over. So it was kind of weird that she couldn't tell me <laughs> herself. Do you remember the denomination of that church that your grandparents attended? Yes, it was uh, the Baptist. They, they had always been Baptist. So the pastor came over and taught me about, you know, how the ego is on the throne of the heart. And when we ask Jesus to come into our hearts, that that it displaces the ego and then Jesus is on the throne of our heart. So I thought that was kind of cool. And I, you know, okay, let's give this a shot. And you're um, nine at this time? Yes. Okay. And you understood ego or yeah. explained that well to you? Well, I already understood it from going to the ashrams. So wow. right, yeah, they just, right. Uh, they, they taught a lot about that. So then um, I decided to give this a shot and I got down on my knees and I prayed the prayer. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins and all that. 
And uh, then I got baptized at uh, the next Sunday service. And here's the weird thing. My grandmother changed. She was no longer very nice. She became really? authoritarian. She was very strict. It was weird. It was very, very strange. I, I did not understand what was going on. Now, remember, my uncle was still living there. My uncle was not. He's no longer here, no longer with us. But he was not a very nice person. I'll just put it that way. You were nine and he was 17. Yes. And um, so grandma said, you know, um, missing some silverware. Did you take some silverware outside and leave it in the yard? And I, no, I didn't. And the only time I would take silverware out is if I was going to eat something and I'd go out on the steps and sit and eat and then bring it back in and wash it up and put it away. Um, well, she said, well, nobody else did. So you have to have done that. You had to have taken the silverware outside or somewhere and left it out there. And so she accused me of lying. And I know I did not take the silverware out. So I'm like, what's going on here? What is happening? And then this is this freaked me out. You have to understand my mom never hit me. She never spanked me. She didn't need to. She treated me so so well, so respectfully. I didn't, you know, throw tantrums. I didn't throw, you know, make it difficult for her. She didn't not, she didn't, she never needed to, to hit me. My grandmother slapped me across the face. Oh, and that wow. Was wow. Intense, you guys. Wow. Because here's, here's somebody who's supposed to love me and protect me from harm, who is inflicting harm on right. me because she thought I, I was lying to her. Yeah. So that happened another time. And then. Um, so wait, I'm going to stop you just right mm -hmm. there. And I, I think as listeners start to hear a lot of our stories, I know the whole thing of corporal punishment is very uh, near to my heart as far as Christian teaching on that. So to hear that you're nine years old, falsely accused, and you're slapped across the face, does she ever, does she realize that that was done in anger? Did she ever address it? Did you guys ever talk about that? Was that just something that you had to hold within yourself? Mm, she did not talk about it. This is something that to her, it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So there was no discussion. <laughs> it was, uh, it, it was the way she saw it. And that's the way it was. And she did um, it a second time again, a second time. And then another time she put a bar of soap in my mouth. So I had to go through that. And the thing is, is my uncle was her baby. That was the baby of the family. And so, of course, he would never have done anything, you know, like that. So, you know, honestly, my uncle was a jerk. He stole some things from me. I mean, who steals from a nine-year-old or 10-year-old, you know? Teenage um, assholes, <laughs> lots of them <laughs> in the world. <laughs> so I found my address book in his bedroom and I had written in pencil and he erased it and wrote in pen. So yeah, he, he was a jerk. I'm sure he was lying because then I would take the blame and, you know, he th probably thought that was funny, amusing. Yeah. And how, and you were still nine or had you turned 10? Um, uh, probably 10. I turned 10 somewhere in there. And the following uh, year, probably getting close to uh, somewhere around summer, I wrote my mom and said, I, I got to leave. I can't stay here. That um, it's just not working out. So she flew me back. And this is where it gets interesting because I know in the book, it said that my mother was um, living in an apartment that was for adults only. And, and she told me that she just moved in there. Her car had broken down and she didn't have money to fix it, but that apartment was close enough to work that she could walk to work. And so when I moved in, landlady said that I couldn't stay there, that she would, my mother would have to move out and she had just moved in. So money was really, really difficult. But on top of it, what Melody probably did not know was that my mother was dealing with depression and you know, suicidal thoughts and stuff. So mm. it was pretty, it was a pretty heavy time for my mom. 
And, you know, here she had to, she had me to worry about and take care of on top of uh, her money problems and depression and stuff like that. Were you aware of any of this? Uh, Because it does sound like you were a very aware child. When you went back with her, could you tell that she was struggling? I think she mentioned to to me when I was still at my grandparents. I seem to remember something about depression. I don't remember very clearly, though. But um, I was very aware that um, me being there was difficult for her, her taking care of me. It, it, because see the the book what bothers me is the book kind of makes makes it sound like I was a dog and you know hey this apartment doesn't take dogs can anybody take this dog <laughs> absolutely a- absolutely uh, I I just um you know for the listeners and it will be in our show notes but of course we're talking about the book uh, that Melody Green wrote called No Compromise the Life Story of Keith Green and in that she describes uh, this time period in Dawn's life. And I know the first time I read it and then reading it again, it's exactly that sense. And even wondering, you know, how up for you being questioned about this, because it is a painful telling, I think. And um, also for you to talk about your mother's struggles and just in Christianity in general, there's not space. And of course, back then too, I don't think we knew as much about mental health issues as we do know today, but I'm thinking in my head of all of the opportunities they could have had to reach out to help your mother. But the solution was none of those things, right? I guess you're going to tell us what the solution ended up being. Right. So, yeah. So my options for people to move in with was not that great. Keith and Melody were the best option. First, there was a a mother-father figure and they were not on alcoholics or doing drugs or anything like that. The book did make it sound like it was my aunt that I was going to go move with. It sounded, she made it sound like she drank all of the time and did drugs night and day. And that was, I don't think that was the case. Um, she was with a, a guy that she had been with for long enough to be married under common law in California. So mm-hmm. I, I called him Uncle Jesse and her the Aunt Kathy. So they were family. But at that time, they were getting deeper and deeper into alcoholism and uh, was not a good place to go. So I chose Keith and Melody. So like in the book, she talks about how they were picking me up and taking me to these Bible studies all the time. They only took me a couple of times, and then the rest, they had somebody come pick me up. And when I got there, it wasn't like I was hanging out with them. I was just hanging out with the people that were there. So it wasn't like they were spending a lot of time with me. They were busy with the adults or something, I guess. Were these Bible studies in uh, their house or the other houses there, or were they at other churches or other people's homes? Let's see. The church we went to was, um, I can't remember. Was it the, the vineyard? vineyard? The vineyard, yes. Uh, we were meeting on the on the beach, having church service on the beach. Yeah, that was pretty cool. And the uh, the couple that were acrobats that had the goat on the front porch and the monkey and a few other animals. animals. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Okay, wait, wait, wait. A goat and a monkey on the front porch? So tell well, us the, more the about that. The, yeah, the goat was on the front porch. The monkey was inside the house in a big cage. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. And I think they had a skunk for a while. I can't remember their name, but it's in the book. Okay. And, so in your 10, almost 11 at about this time? I am 10. When I moved in, it was before, just before I turned 11. 11. So you've been to ashrams. You've kind of danced with the Hare Krishnas. You've moved to the Midwest and you're gone to a Baptist church. And now you're in L.A., with acrobats who have animals <laughs> on their board and at the beach, I'm sure that was probably preferable to what you experienced in Colorado. But do you remember what you were thinking spiritually as far as just that input and the people that you're around and the general vibe of everything? Yeah, so it was pretty good until I moved in with Keith and Melody. And then something 
changed. I don't understand the changing thing. Why do these people change? So when I did move in, it was, um, you know, it seemed okay. One thing in the book, uh, Melody says that uh, I insisted on calling them mom and dad, and that's not quite right. I insisted on calling them Keith and Melody, and Keith kept telling me I had to call them. I had to call them mom and dad. So that was weird mm. to me because it didn't, it just, I don't know, it just didn't feel right because they weren't really my mom and dad. They were just, you know, in that position responsibility, but not necessarily my mom and dad. So and do you remember when you had, I, t- I take it from the book that you mainly had those conversations with Keith as far as, mm-hmm. you know, where you would go to live. Do you remember what those conversations were like? Not really. And I think maybe that's why Melody didn't, M- Melody thought I was insisting on calling a mom and dad because she hadn't talked to Keith. Maybe Keith didn't tell her that he wanted me to call them mom and dad. I don't know. But um, as far as the the vibe, so to speak, I guess you could call it, it felt okay. You know, Keith was insisting on me calling them mom and dad. That was a little bit weird, but I got past it. Okay, that's what he wants. I will do it, you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, So then soon after I moved in. And when I moved in, let me clarify that Cindy was was living there with her daughter, Kelly. Right. And so there were three bedrooms. And I think all of us were in the one bedroom, Cindy and Kelly and I. Then the piano was in the middle room. And they ended up moving the piano out. Or I can't remember exactly what happened to the piano. But Cindy ended up in the middle bedroom. And then Keith and Melody at the other end. We all shared a bathroom. And for for whatever reason, somebody had gotten into Melody's makeup. And so you have to understand, I have always been, and I still am, a very much a tomboy. I like to play in the dirt. I, like yep. to play I, remember, I remember you in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. With, yeah, with the horses on the yeah. farm, for sure. Yeah. 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 How often did you see me wear a dress? Never. <laughs> that's that's one other Never. reason I, I totally related to you, Dawn, because I was the tomboy too. I was not into makeup or dresses. And so, yeah, mm. yeah, no, you were tomboy for yeah. sure. Yeah, we clicked. We clicked really well. We did. <laughs> um, yeah. I had a skateboard. I, you know, played outside all the time. I just wasn't into to makeup. I didn't have any desire. So uh, one day Keith sat me down on the sofa and he said, uh, somebody got into Melody's makeup. Was that you? And I said, no, uh-uh, that's not me. I didn't do that. Well, we asked everybody else and everybody else said that they didn't do it. So you had to be the one who did it. And I'm like, what the, <laughs> what the <laughs> hell is this keep happening? Is yeah. happening? Wow. Um, so I feel like I'm losing my mind. But, um, and then Keith told me, Kelly, four years old, Kelly was baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. So Keith said he could believe her when she said that she didn't get into the makeup, that she was telling the truth. So oh, that wow. was weird. very weird. Wow. Um, so I continued to say, no, it wasn't me. And um, he kept saying I was lying and I needed to tell the truth. It was very important that I told the truth. And I, I was in tears. I'm like, I'm not lying. And then finally, it was about three in the morning. You oh, guys. Shit. Oh, so shit. this went on for, so how long yes. is this going on? When did it start? If it's at I three in the morning. I'm, I'm going to say like, Five, six in the, in the afternoon, the evening. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Yes. But then then I finally said, okay, fine. Fine. I did it. Can I go to bed now? <laughs> wow. You know what? Yeah. There's uh, the research. I remember watching a documentary recently that is talking about or, or discussing the interrogation techniques of police and the whole sleep deprivation mm-hmm. and constant insisting mm-hmm. and what happens with the final, you know, finally after however many hours, the confession and the understanding now of how absolutely unreliable that is. 
and and how mm-hmm. it's so it's like not even admissible in court in so many uh, situations now. And so, wow, Don, I am so sorry that you went through that interrogation. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was just very confusing. I thought I was losing my mind because it was the same thing that happened with my grandparents, my grandmother. Yeah. So I was very confused and just did not understand. I felt scared. You know, I felt weird, like something's wrong with me. Mm. So, yeah, that was. Were you in contact with your with your mom, with your real mom at that point at all? A little bit. Yes. I think she she required it. Um, She required that I come visit her every once in a while. Yeah, she wanted to keep in touch with me. Was this before, around the same time of some sort of legal process for you to be technically that Keith and Melody to be your official guardian? So yes, I um, had a social worker, though she never talked to me. I don't understand how that works. I I thought they had to talk to the child. Have yeah, check-in. yes, <laughs> you know. Uh, I only saw her once and I believe they talked to her more than once. I just hadn't been around, but she did not re- need to talk to me for whatever reason, I guess. The it, the book is correct in that the state required that there are no other people, adults in the house. If there are any children in the house that, the, that Keith and Melody need to have adopted them, become legal guardian or they have to be their own children. Hmm. So, so that's when not only were they, you know, running out of room in their own house, but they had this legal thing where I had to have space in the house. I could not have other people in the house. Right. And then that's when the renting of other properties started. Yes. It's about the same time. I can't say that it was because of me, but it happened at the same time. They were running out of space and they wanted to expand. So, um, yeah, that's what happened with that. You know, Dawn, there was another part in the book I remember reading. It's when Melody talks about Keith basically informing her that you were going to come and live with them. And I think the words she used was uh, that she felt something, quote, like rising in her chest because Keith had made the decision on his own. And I'm just going to say my observation, and this is maybe kind of going forward in years, but when I came in 79 there for six months or so, I don't know that we had all that much interaction. But then when we all moved to Texas and we were all living in the ranch house together, you know, we're all, we're all seeing each other basically 24 seven. I always had this sense that there was a tension like this underlying resentment that Melody held towards you. I just, I saw it in the way she interacted with you in the things that she'd say or not say. And it just makes me think going back to that time in California, how you came in. And I think as in many things, as I saw with Keith is that what got done was what Keith decided would get done, right? It really wasn't about what do other people or what other people want. So it's like, yep, this is what we're doing. And she probably didn't have much say in it. But I always just had that sense that there was this underlying issue. And it actually made me sad because I felt like, wow, who's there to be really tender and comforting towards Dawn? And I just didn't see that happening for you kind of on any level. But of course, I didn't always see everything, but I don't know. Does any of that ring true for you? Well, I have to say that I did not get a lot of warm cuddlies from either of them. Mm -hmm. Um, Just to to be open about that, I did not feel comforted by either one of them. And I, I always felt like I was the redheaded stepchild, <laughs> so to speak, you know, just mm. kind of, here I am, um, just trying to get through life here until I can get out on my own. Yeah. So yet yeah, it, it was a, a feeling of distance. Now I'm not saying that she completely shunned me, but she was not all that involved in my life. 
I will say that when I was being homeschooled, she did make sure that I improved my writing skills and my English and had me do exercises. She'd leave me little notes on write about this and then she would read over it and correct it and help me to get better. So it wasn't like she was completely absent, but she uh, was not warm and cuddly, but neither was Keith. Right. And I have I have a theory, an opinion on what I think is the reason why Keith was not very positive towards me. I feel like that he was afraid that if he were to compliment me or tell me that I did a good job or, or anything along those lines, that I would become proud. And then, you know, pride mm. cometh come before a fall. God does not hear the prayers of those who are proud, you know, things like that. So wow. he was afraid to compliment me. And what I learned from that was I'm not good enough. No matter how hard I try, I can't please him. And the only attention that I got, well, I can't say only, I really shouldn't. Um, most of the attention that I got from him was when I was in trouble. So well, let's, I want to come back to that in trouble in just a moment. But I just want to say that, yeah, the, the withholding of encouragement, the withholding of affirmation because of the fear of pride. And, you know, certainly anybody who's followed Last Days Ministries and the messages of Keith Green knows that, yeah, pride, that's a big, bad sin. And I know that Keith himself struggled with his own ego and his pride so much. And it's an interesting thing how we often project onto others whatever our individual hangups are, right? So if we really are struggling with an area, we're going to assume that everyone else is struggling as much rather than seeing those things as, yeah, that's that's my own personal issue to deal with, but I don't need to project and assume and try to pound it out of everyone else, especially a young teenage girl that I have taken into my home and I'm going to father this kid. And, and you know, Dawn, that's just really tough because especially as we are adolescent girls beginning to come into womanhood, that affirming father figure is so vital and so important. And I'm not slamming Keith in the sense of, you know, well, he should have done a better job, but because all, I don't think any of us had really great father mm -hmm. figures in our lives. But it's a little ironic that the idea of, okay, once you become a Christian and you're following Jesus with all your heart, and now you're going to be able to be the best parent ever, but it doesn't quite work out that way. Right. Um, yeah. And I will just say, you know, I came, I think you were still in high school when I came and I, people will know from my interview that I came for the first ICT school. And there was the introduction of the Father Heart of God message. And I know that was pretty revolutionary for the people who were there before that message came through because there was absolutely a severity about the whole ministry. So stark to me because, you know, I came from some charismatic church area where people were really emotive. And that was a staggering reality to me coming into the ranch house and working for the first time under uh, people who had been there from the California days. And it was as though it was sinful to smile. I remember actually writing that in my <laughs> journal at one point. And so that was the tone of the place. And and just imagining you coming from where you're coming from as a young girl into that severity. I mean, that's the the belief that's coloring everything. So, yeah. You said that um, you had interaction when you got into trouble. What sort of things did you get into trouble for? Not being happy. <laughs> really? That was so um, ironic. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Not being happy, having a bad attitude because I wasn't happy. I was lonely. I you right. know, felt scared. I felt like I was losing my mind. I wasn't good enough. I was just getting by and hoping that I would not catch Keith's attention because it usually meant something was bad. Something was wrong. So, wow. yeah, um, it's frustrating because no matter what I did, it wasn't good enough. So why be happy? <laughs> 
Was that it before was the move to Texas or mostly after or both? It was mostly after. Before we moved to Texas, it got to the point where I would actually lie about something that I did or didn't do because I was trying to avoid getting into trouble. And lying is a very, very serious sin. And Keith did take his belt off and hit me a few times, a few different, about maybe three separate incidences. Wow. Wait, 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 wait. mm. You were what, 12 years old? This was, yeah, this is before we moved. We moved to Texas. I think I was 14 going on 15. So the times he hit you with the belt, that was in California? Yes. Yes. So, yeah, because yeah. I don't think he, I don't remember him doing it when we were all living together in the house in Texas. Had that stopped when you got to Texas? Correct. It did. It did. And Melody hit me once with a wooden spoon. I can't remember what that was all about. Well, and as you'll learn, you know, from different episodes, I mean, that is in instruction manuals on how to raise children in a lot of Christianity. So, you know, I myself, so fucked up. <laughs> it is, it so is. I mean, it's, it's one of my biggest, biggest, biggest regrets. And, you know, if I could have a voice anywhere, it's to really even go to current churches and say, you have to stand against this message, the wooden spoon, rods, the belt. Uh, the studies are out. It's very harmful to children. It doesn't do the work that they're expecting that to do. So I know that we've talked again about, you know, not wanting to throw people under the bus or rake people over the coals, but to really call this out, this was standard practice among Christians in disciplining children. And you're absolutely correct that lying is considered terrible sin. And so part of that theology is The pain is what will drive it out. We're going to drive the sin out of these children. And sometimes you do that by striking. And it's so, so crazy. And it's so against, you know, even the concept of the shepherd, right? They say a shepherd with a sheep. Have you ever seen a shepherd beat a sheep? It's just so (laughs) wrong in every way. So um, I know that they were young and still trying to figure out how to parent, but absolutely Sorry that you had to endure that. And every time it's mentioned, I just want to be able to go on and record and say, this has got to stop. This is not yeah. how you discipline children. I well, I'm sorry, but I, there's, there's this part of me that's just like at age 12, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I did and I deeply regret the spanking that we did with our children. Again, the scripture that says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child. The rod of discipline will drive it far from him. And that whole manual idea that, yes, the correct way, the godly way to raise your children is, it says, beat your son and he will live. (laughs) It's just so, so messed up. But even that kind of stopped by the time they were five or six or seven years old. Because, I mean, at age 12, you're talking about, you're, you're talking about an adolescent, and I don't know. I don't know. It just seems. Yeah. And and I think Keith was just trying to do his best. I'm best sure he was. He knew how, you know, and that's that's what he was taught. That's what he believed. And that's what he did. So I don't know. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Well, I mean, part- even in, you know, keep. Yeah. Keeping you up through the night. I mean, eventually that would be kind of the style of how we would do it at last days and in times of confession, we would keep people, they would be meetings that would go seven and eight hours to foster that environment to finally confess. And you're exactly right, Sharon. It's the sleep deprivation. It's just the turmoil. It's the uncomfortability. And I mean, I've had people reach out to me since we started this podcast saying they remember those days in the school and they eventually made stuff up because the the hot seat you know, they were on it, people were looking at them, and they eventually just said something so that everybody could end it and go to bed. It Mm. wasn't just in, you know, this is how we we discipline a child. This is also how ultimately they believed God disciplined them. And I know that's a big theme in Keith's life of just really feeling that, that sense of intense guilt over his own sin. Well, and for me, the whole point in so much of this is it's not about, as you said, Tracy, it's not raking somebody over the coals. You and I were 100% guilty as well, but it's the continued veneration 
of this man and this system and the Bible and the incredible commitment he had to the truth and no compromise and we're to follow the Bible all the way. And that's why that's why we're doing this, because no, it's not good. It's not right. And because of the continued holding Keith up as this incredible example of the ideal Christian man, no, he's just human. He's just human like all the rest of us. And he's human and he was young. And I can't echo that enough because there'd be no need, you know, to even go into all of this. We've all gotten older, right? Who wants to have everything that we did when we were 20 <laughs> brought out? But because that book has been written as the only record of wasn't this the most amazing time and the most amazing godly environment and Jesus moved so amazing and we, you know, all need to be like that, that's what this portion is. No, no, we were young and now we're older and we all need to be able to come to the record and say, did we mean to do these things and, you know, cause harm? No, absolutely not. But now we can absolutely look back and say, we got that very wrong. Yeah. Don, when we first moved to Texas, if I recall, you wound up in the dorm with all of I don't know how many of us were there, like another 15 women sharing one bathroom. How did that, how did that feel for you? You were what, 14 years old and in this, this room just crammed with so many other, some of us teenagers, but others adults. Right. I don't know. It was just, it was something that I had to deal with. I had to accept it was not a choice. This is something that I've been able to do most of my life and get through difficult times is, you know, this is just the way it is. We'll get through it and keep going and not let it get me down too bad anyway. But right. um, it, it was it was OK. I Everybody was friendly for the most part. I don't remember arguments or people being nasty or, or mean. I could see it being even more difficult if there were conflicts and personality and people not getting along. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think for the most part, people were, were trying to be on their best behavior and be loving and kind to each right. other. Yeah. And you already had some base of relationship with a good number of the women uh, coming out of California. There was Michelle and Carol and Francine and Pody. So I don't know, did you, mm -hmm. did you have any kind of like friendship or camaraderie with anyone? Or were you still feeling very isolated? Back in uh, California, I remember spending time with Pody because I think she studied botany. Yeah, I think it was forestry, botany. I think, or something. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. And I was getting into plants. And I had a bunch of plants in my, my bedroom. So I was learning some things from her. And Francine and I got along pretty well and spent some time with her. Later, after Keith, I did have some very good friendships with some people. I think it was because I, I was older and was more in a way on my own, mm -hmm. <laughs> if that mm -hmm. makes sense, because I was no yeah. longer a child in a family. Um, right. And so I had made some friendships afterwards. All right. Yeah, before it was, it was still kind of isolated. Dawn, how did uh, how did you feel when um, Josiah and later Bethany were born? What was your relationship with them, with the kids? Josiah and I were best buds. It, he was like my little brother. I mean, he felt like um, a, a familiar soul. You know what I mean? That yes. kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. it was, he was he was a, an amazing little being, a little person. And um, we got along very well. Bethany <laughs> was a little pistol. She um, <laughs> and had to do things her way. It wasn't as easy to take care of her, but you know she was she was uh, unique. And I don't know. I just uh, I appreciated spending time with them, but I honestly I felt like I spent way more time with them than Keith and Melody did. And I felt it was a little bit of a burden, more than what I should have been forced to do. It was a requirement as part of my duties as a 
a member of the family. I guess you could put it that way. But um, I Did learned a lot. Did you ever have those thoughts at that time? Like, is this something that as you've looked back, you see that? Or do you remember feeling that at the time? Like, I don't get to go and play as much as I think a child my age should. A little bit. There was, there was a little bit of that. Just like, I'm not sure why I have to take care of their children all of the time. I don't understand that. I can see being a member of the family and needing to do chores, like we sh- all shared a bathroom. This was in the in the in the house across the street, the little house, yeah. So I was required to clean the bathroom. We all shared one bathroom, and I was okay with that because that's part of being a part of the family, and I used it too. But um, these are not my children. Why am I taking care of them after school every single day? Why am I folding their laundry? Why am I making their bed? Why am I washing their dishes in the morning that have been sitting on the counter, not rinsed. I mean, you could at least rinse them, please. Thank you. But, um, you know, I was required to wash their dishes before I could leave for school. So I thought that was overstepping their bounds as parents. It's not something that would be naturally part of being part of the family. That's, you know, you're our live-in maid. (laughs) That's what that is. So, um, but I have to tell you this, that when I was um, 17, I did actually talk to Keith about having to watch the kids all the time and never being able to take care of, you know, go out and ride my horse. And I still to this day am amazed that I said anything because I was so scared. Yeah. Of Keith. But I did. And he said, you know what? I'll think about it. He later, he said, I think Linda can't remember her last name. She moved in and she would mm-hmm. take care of the kids all the time so mm-hmm. that I didn't have to, which was cool. Still can't believe that I talked to him about that, that I brought that up. Yeah. Good for you and good for him for listening. I, I remember being down at the house there. We would have leadership meetings, you know, Martin and I and Wayne and Kath would come down, especially when the, uh, extension or the addition was was put on, I do remember thinking that it's like it didn't matter what time of day it was, whether it was morning or afternoon or evening, that you were obligated to take care of the children a lot. And it just seemed unbalanced and inappropriate and kind of like you weren't really, really like the daughter, you were the convenient child care provider. That was my impression course, I was probably too afraid or not thinking anything about it in terms of my ability to step in and say something to Keith or Mel. But I'm, I'm so proud of you for have, finding that courage to speak up on your behalf. Because I think that's something we all, we all, that was really suppressed, right? You don't in that culture, in that environment, you do not speak up on behalf of yourself. You don't ask for anything for yourself. It's all about let's continue to sacrifice for God, for the kingdom, for the ministry. Yeah. And I have to say, I have to, you know, (laughs) I have to jump in here because that was something when I came in and I often was watching things and noticing things and tucking things away. And you're exactly right. It's like, well, who am I to jump into a situation if I think something's a bit off? I don't know the whole story. I don't know where they're at. But I do know that the people who then moved in to help take care of the children have had a lot of years of having to unwind some of the abuse that they felt also. That echoes very much what Don was feeling as far as being taken advantage of, being just taken for granted and not treated very well, treated as housekeepers, treated as babysitters. So I am very glad that you got some relief from that. But, you know, that as we've been talking about, you know, this whole kind of culty vibes, that's one of the classic signs, guys. And and I did. One of my first jobs coming in there was to take Josiah to school. And it didn't last very long, but I did arrive in the morning. And it was definitely something that I noticed. And Sharon, I've heard you notice. It wasn't right. 
<laughs> no. The, the way that the, the jobs were assigned, this was not right. It was a step too far. And I think a lot of people have had to unwind all that. And again, we get it. We all were young. You know, they're, you know, staying up late because they're, they're musicians. But no, no, then no, 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 no. Wait, wait. I <laughs> okay. can't let that one go. Staying okay, up late good, because good. they're musicians. No, that's just a bullshit excuse. You're staying up late because you don't want to have the discipline that you're imposing on everybody else at this fucking place, right? On everybody because why? else. Because the rules don't apply to you because you have some special gift or some special calling or some special whatever. And I'm sorry, it's just bullshit. Okay, you can continue. Yeah, I and, I, and we have to call that out. And again, because it hasn't been called out. So I look back like now, if I'm to write a book about my younger years, I'm going to call that out. Like I I was crazy here. I abused my kids here. I didn't you know, set out a right environment that's conducive for their development. I don't say I was... <laughs> most amazing parent. And these were amazing times that Jesus just moved and we were all just sold out to Jesus. I don't describe it that way. And and that's part of why I was so happy to reconnect with you, Don, and also be able to say, hey, these things that we were picking up that seemed to really be screaming into my intuition, were we off base? And then be able to say, hey, we saw it and we are sorry that that was the vibe of that time and that we all were in kind of the same stew and not being able to say things. And then how awesome you are for Mm -hmm. enduring all that and getting ahead of the story of the different things that you have to share of how you've kind of come out of all that. But we echo that we recognize, yes, that was actually a step too far and abusive. Yeah, Yeah. it was using and abusing someone. And I think, Dawn, you mentioned feeling really lonely there in Texas, which makes sense. Come on, we were all out in the middle of nowhere. And you you loved and had this great relationship with Josiah and also felt, you know, even though she was difficult, some affinity with, with Bethany. And so I can imagine that would be an internal conflict. You know, you're getting probably the human interaction that you need, you're getting more from these toddlers than you are from others. And, yes. and yet you're, you're having this, this responsibility imposed upon you, which wasn't fair, but it, it was kind of a mixed bag, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was, um, I mean, it was enjoyable to, to take care of them. I mean, I appreciated that time with them. But uh, at the same time, it was it was too much. Um, yeah. You know, like like I said, being a member of the family. Yeah, I, I understand doing my part. Like if we all sit down to dinner, you know, helping out with the dishes or helping with the cooking and, and stuff like that. I'm OK with that. But it was it was too much. And I remember thinking there were times when we were on the road and I was watching the kids and I was thankful that. Well, there was one time. OK, so I'll say this. One time when uh, Melody said that I could go on, take a break from watching the kids, and I did not because they were not paying attention. And those kids were all over the place. And Melody was, Melody is very social. She loves to talk to people. She's not like Keith in that she's in, she loves to be involved with people. And that's where she, you know, she just kind of, was standoffish with a lot of people because she didn't want to get involved in in my opinion. Um, But she was very social and loved to talk to people, but she was distracted and the kids were running around and they were climbing on stuff. And I, you know, I'm not taking a break. I need to watch these kids because they're not paying attention. You were worried for their physical safety. Yes. Because they were climbing on stuff. They could have fallen off. Could have hurt themselves. Nobody was watching. But um, at the same time, I was thinking that they have these children, these beautiful children, and they don't spend very much time with them. I mean, they really don't spend very much time because I'm the one who's who's got them all of the time. And when it wasn't me, it was somebody else. So after school, I was usually taking care of the the kids. Um, but I did have time to take care of the horses on the weekend because I did stuff with the horses on the weekend. You and I did stuff on the, 
We Sorry. did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's let's talk about that for a second, because I remember. I was going to say, I think I have to jump in and ask a question, because for those of our listeners who heard Sharon's interview with I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist, uh, she talks about horses actually being an idol in her life before coming to Last Days and having to lay that down. And so now we're talking about a horse at Last Days. So you guys, can you fill me in on how that happened? Did Sharon do take backs with God? Did she make a golden idol in the shape of a horse? Will the ground open up and have one of them for lunch? <laughs> All right, anybody wondering about that last bit, you've got to listen. You got to go Google the song by Keith Green. So you want to go back to Egypt? <laughs> I got to admit, those were some pretty funny lyrics, and they still make me chuckle. <laughs> yes, yeah, so please stay tuned for part two, dropping next week, to find out how both Dawn and Sharon were able to bond over their love for horses and definitely find some reprieve as more painful events continue to unfold. Mm, yeah. And if you are enjoying our podcast, please follow or subscribe. It only takes a click to do that. We're old, but we're learning that this actually helps <laughs> other people find us when they are searching. And if you have a moment more, give us a rating with just another click. And if you're super ambitious and can spare 30 seconds, maybe even leave a review comment as well. And you can also follow us on Instagram, feetofclay.cultsisters, to see images and get the latest updates. Thanks so much for listening, everyone, and we'll see you again next time. See you around.